I'll watch my P's and Q's now. <laughs> oh, come on. Do you ever really watch <laughs> your P's and Q's? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> This is the time we cause trouble or trouble causes us one of the two. <laughs> All right. Synergistic. Yeah. <laughs> a little, a little uh, discussion has had already begun uh, uh -huh. before. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, I, I did a little, you know, so we're defending befriending. Well, what would Jesus do? What would Paul do? What should we do? Right. And so the, you know, one of the responses was, what does that matter? <laughs> it's just, what should we do? Ah. Then I challenged it back with a, well, if we live in a solipsis, solipsistic worldview, that's okay. But once the other comes into our life, their position matters. Uh, you know, so there was, it, we, and then it was kind of going back and forth. It was a really good, really good little ah, discussion I'll, I'll with my, out, with yeah. my buddy. Yeah, that was with uh, Bill Legault um, okay. from Salem. Yeah. Uh, great guy. Uh, so you're having a good time. So, uh, yeah, we're on and some people are already watching us. So, hey, oh. welcome to the Wild Theology hey. Podcast. This is me, Phil Wyman, and that is John W. Moorhead. Um, and uh, we're co-conspirators in uh, the crimes of trying to do good works that aren't always perceived as being good works, are they? That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, so so tell a little bit about um, your story of how you got to the place of befriending people who might not deserve it. And, you know, at least in the eyes of others, that's the case, right? Yeah, some would say I don't deserve it. Sometimes that's so. But uh, let's Definitely. see. Well, basically, in a nutshell, uh, I, gr growing up, I was uh, agnostic, but we also had roots in a, a Mormon offshoot. Uh, reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. And I eventually uh, got baptized, was a member of that church for a few years, had that burning in the bosom experience, that subjective feeling that the church was true. And uh, I eventually encountered uh, Christian apologetic material. I read uh, Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults and he had a chapter on Mormonism. But uh, although it didn't directly uh, relate to my particular branch that I was involved in, there was enough there to raise doubt. And so I uh, reluctantly became an evangelical, but I was a very troubled, skeptical one. If I had a what I thought was a religious experience in this other tradition, how do I know Christianity is true? So I eventually became very attracted to an apologetic approach. And I was involved in because I thought, you know, I think uh, Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict kind of summarizes an evangelical attitude. Uh, right. You know? um, right. So which, I was which briefly describe that. Um, well, approach. Yeah, um, uh, some some colleagues uh, and I, uh, 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 Philip Johnson in Australia came up with uh, the term for the particular approach, heresy rationalist apologetic. And that is, we tend to look at other uh, religious groups, particularly the so-called cults or new religions, as systems of heresy. And uh, right. the way we analyze them and relate to them is uh, through comparative charts, right? Here's what we believe. It's from the Bible. Here's what you guys believe. Yeah. It's false. Here's why. And now we've refuted it. And the curious thing is not only does that function for many as kind of a boundary to protect us from them doing apologetic right. defense and confirmation for us. Sometimes we think it's an evangelistic model, too. It's like if I tear down what you believe and say the Bible doesn't say that, that that should yeah. warm your heart. To my message, right? And right, uh, right. I just came to see uh, challenges with that. I started reading in history of Christian mission and looking at how missionaries uh, in overseas, non-Western contexts would come to love the people, embed themselves in the culture, 
learn about what they they believe and not only proclaim to them and defend but actually get involved in their life ways and uh, I thought that was interesting and I wondered why the contrast and I eventually just couldn't do the apologetics thing anymore I didn't think it was biblical uh, looking at things like Paul in Acts 17 and so I eventually got out of there and got into a cross-cultural missions approach and eventually that would lead to questions I started asking myself uh, I was doing culturally sensitive evangelism and I still believe in sharing my faith I think everybody shares what they believe in and find most passionate right right but I asked myself what do I do when the people I'm sharing with simply choose not to embrace my religious pathway how do I live as a faithful disciple of Christ yeah. in the midst of religious plurality and 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 do that thing and that's how I kind of came to this multi-faith engagement or religious diplomacy thing so so you don't Wipe the dust off your, shake the dust off your shoes and move on? I, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> no, that doesn't mean that there are times when I encounter people who just want nothing to do with what I have, my my approach, and, you know, people in other religious traditions. And and sometimes you may have to take a, a harder stance. They're rejecting you. You're rejecting, you know, it, we're right. just at, at loggerheads. But for the most part, um, I think we can uh, come to understand others and, and, uh, as as Walter Martin used to say, agree to disagree agreeably. And, right, 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 right. Well, so I, I remember having some of those charts that were like, you know, here's here's on this side what the Bible says, on this side what Mormons believe. Here's what the Bible says, here's what Jehovah Witnesses believe. I, I remember having, the you know, the charts you were talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, what, what about you? I don't know if I've ever heard your story about how, I mean, I encountered you, we encountered each other. I think I was more in transition when we first met. Um, yeah. I, and I, was I already in Salem? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we had bumped into each other a couple times before that. I thought we had met at an uh, EMNR conference, Evangelical Ministries to New Religions. And I was, on leadership then, but I was, I was having what? serious doubts with the we, Yeah, we had met before that. And actually you okay. asked, that was the one at Biola? It might be. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Cause you had contacted me and said, would you come? I could okay. use your. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that was. <laughs> and I it was caused a bit of a off. stir because I was, I was doing yeah. a thing about befriending witches, which, <laughs> you know, it was, it was in a, kind of a regular size classroom, but people were hanging out the doors and yeah. <laughs> saying, oh, there was no room inside <laughs> to fill any Just saying in. something for that conference, because they didn't usually have met very many attendees. So for whatever reason, <laughs> okay. you them in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that was a lot of fun. Um, so I, uh, after becoming a, a Christian, which was kind of a radical experience, um, you know, that was me getting slapped across the face by an invisible hand on two separate occasions. <laughs> um, that's when I was 21. It was, um, it was very quickly that I ran into some people who were doing um, work with like uh, the ex Mormons for Jesus and back when saints alive right. was still around. So this is 1980. Um, and uh, so I, I actually did a little bit of traveling around to churches talking about uh, Mormons and what they believed and, and ended up in Manti very quickly. And, okay. you know, so I was good friends with Bill McKeever and, okay. um, you know, he was still down in San Diego at the time right. and I was living in Escondido. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, um, oh, what was her name? Great. Remember Granny Greer? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> Film the Godmakers, I think, or the God right, Makers. right, yeah. yeah. Oh, and actually, she's she was just a lovely person. I mean, <laughs> she she was so cool. I remember driving her to some event one time, and we stopped to get gas, and there there were some bikers there, you know. And she's dressed in her outfit to look like you know uh, the uh, the uh, Mormon, you know the 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 old west. Mormon woman traveling right. across the country. She would tell her whole story and have the outfit on and um, you know the pioneer look. 
and <laughs> she gets out of the car and there's some really rough biker there and she just walks up to him and they start talking and this guy melted in front of her oh, <laughs> and nice. she said you would make a beautiful christian <laughs> <laughs> and he was like oh <laughs> yeah it was it was fantastic um so so i was involved with that and i um I, I I just kind of naturally lent myself toward trying to befriend people, even if I was debating them. Right. You know, so if I, you know, if I was in the craziest situations, it didn't matter. So I got to know people in Manti, you know, but I'm still hanging out with all the street preachers and the circus that it was. So you Manti. really didn't shift from an adversarial kind of mindset? Um, not, no. Um, or as well, I did. Yeah, yeah. So, so see... I would I would enjoy debating those points, but for me it was never adversarial. Okay. It was talking about life and what do we believe, and you know, yeah. Let's and 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 so it wasn't a significant shift for me because you know for me I love debating, and I'm still passionate about debating. Yeah, you know. So um, although there was a lot to learn because the people who loved debating oftentimes had that adversarial position. Right. Right. And, and so I was encircled by it. Right. And I, and I kind of had to swim my way through it to find my own place. Um, now a lot of that came to, um, to the forefront, finding my own place had a lot to do with studying neo-paganism in preparation for moving to Salem, because I, I figured I'm not just going to a town where there's witches, you know, a few witches. I'm going to live and breathe and hang out with neighbors who are witches. So I got to, I got to find out what they, not just what they believe, but what they believe about me why they identify with me or don't identify with me, what they like, don't like, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, and so then I was developing uh, deep relationships with these people. And that transitioned me to maybe a deeper look at what this friendship thing means, right? Then, of course, you do that, aggressively enough or you know openly enough and you're going to take it on the chin because <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. right yeah yeah so so you've had some experience with that right uh you mean that pardon the, taking the it on the chin yeah the yeah yeah let me has, 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 let me close the dog the has to be a part of the event yes hold on one sec <laughs> there we go door door closed live to facebook you know um, yeah yeah you mean uh, from uh, within the evangelical tribe? Is that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, of course, there's going to be some of it from outside. But from my experience, I get I get more flack from my own tribe than I do from. Yeah, I mean, the the term that others. folks tend to use is interfaith. I, I don't use that term because right. there's some commonalities with interfaith, but I also have some disagreements. But for the purposes of the conversation, you know, there's interfaith and there's intrafaith. And for me, the challenge has always been within evangelicalism is I've gotten some flack. I've had some, I had a pagan gentleman online who took issue with me and said I was unethical because I was advocating an approach that was not only uh, diplomatic and dialogical, but also included at times an interest in, in mutual persuasion, if possible. You shouldn't be evangelizing. That's just not on the mm -hmm. table. And so the disagreement got so strong that I was unethical and this kind of thing. Right. But but by and large, the the reaction from uh, people in other religious tra traditions, even when we, you know, everybody recognizes we seriously disagree. There's no attempt on compromise for anybody. Um, they appreciate uh, the, the attempt. Uh, but it's been from within my, the evangelical tribe. And I think a lot of the, the flat came because I was a part of the counter cult community and evangelicalism. Um, that is a, a right. segment of, for, for folks who don't know, there, there's a segment of uh, evangelicalism that devotes itself specifically to doing apologetic refutation of people in other religious movements. And they call themselves mm. counter cult. 
And I was a part of that. I was a member of Watchman Fellowship uh, in California. I was serving on the board. In fact, I, uh, for a couple of years, I was president of Evangelical Ministries to New Religions, an umbrella organization. And I started to introduce missional ideas. Maybe we don't have to be adversarial. Maybe we can be more like a cross-cultural missionary in an overseas context. And that just did not go over well at all. It went from disagreement over ideas and methodology to uh, ad hominem. I mean, I had folks come to my blog where I was blogging at Moorhead's Musings at the time. Right. And uh, I had folks who uh, accused me of not only being unethical, maybe I wasn't a Christian. Uh, I remember once going uh, on a weekend uh, uh, I'm in Utah and I had uh, Ogden uh, Pagan Group that invited me to come up and do a little presentation. I developed relationships with them and we had a little Saturday activity and I got back and blogged about it. And a Christian posted it afterwards something very short. A comment, but it would it hit right to the matter. It said, birds of a feather, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> right? right? So right, I've been accused right. of being a closet pagan, of being Mormon. You know, how could you possibly yeah. be a real Christian and yet have positive, friendly relationships with people in these groups? And there's not only theological reasons why there's these reactions, there's psychological ones. But yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of flack. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, I, just to put an exclamation point on it. Um, years ago, uh, I lost one of my sons and I had a, a, a well-meaning apologist who came to my blog and said, God was judging me because of mm. my rejection of an apologetic approach. And this was God's judgment. So wow. um, it can get pretty nasty. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I've, I've had similar things like that occur. Yeah. So, so what you, had, what you had said about, there are a lot of reasons biblically for, pursuing friendships uh, goes right to a question that popped up <laughs> on uh, Facebook here. So a friend of mine, Larry Higgins, asks, are there any Bible verses about befriending people in cults? Befriending people in cults. Well, of course, the word cult doesn't show up in the Bible. Uh, right, right. You know, um, but are there Bible verses that talk about befriending people who are in other religious traditions? I, I just think we have to be careful about how we the questions we ask of the Bible, um, I don't know that it should be looked at as a, a rule book, but it does provide examples and stories and illustrations of how people are relating to each other. And I think one of the right. greatest ones is Jesus, for example, with the woman at the well in the Gospel of John, right? He, he uh, yeah. has this conversation with a Samaritan woman. There was enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews. They had all kinds of religious and cultural disagreements. And yet Jesus has this conversation over right. religious things. They, there wasn't enough time for a, a friendship, but they certainly were friendly in their interaction. Right, right, right. And the disciples come upon him because uh, they had left to get water. And they come back and they're marveling. Why in the world is Jesus talking to this woman, Right. One, she's female. Secondly, she's Samaritan. And third, she's alone in that culture. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to have a male accompanying you. Right. So, yeah, there are all kinds of, of problems with that. Um, so I think Jesus is a primary example. Jesus, not only he primarily in the Gospels has interactions with uh, Jews, but there are a few instances. And the fact that they're few makes them even mm -hmm. more significant with Gentiles, with outsiders, a right. Roman centurion. Uh, a Syrophoenician woman and these kinds of things. So Jesus yeah. reaches across and outside of his religious culture and he does it in a positive way. And Jesus is known, what, what was the, the uh, they attempted it as a slur, the, the religious leaders. Jesus had a reputation for hanging around with outsiders, right? You know, he was a drunkard and, and a sinner. Yeah. Right? And uh, he yeah. was too. So he got the personal slur. Yeah. So I think there are plenty yeah. of, even though the Bible doesn't say thou shalt befriend cult members. I think there are plenty of examples in Jesus, in Paul, for taking a very friendly kind of approach. And I see no reason right. to restrict friendships to uh, people who are Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, I suppose it becomes somewhat of a um, difficult question because we don't really find a theology of friendship, right? Right, right. Within the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's not telling us how to like people, right? Or at least I, I would say we we don't see that it's telling us how to like people, right? Uh, you know, I I would uh, I, I have a great 
I have a big problem with the I, I can love somebody and not like them approach. Right, right. You know, I, I, uh, I, I suppose I see a place for that at times. But if I don't like somebody, is that I, pro- with a I probably doesn't. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if I don't like somebody, I probably don't love them. Right, exactly. I, am, am I going to um, give them the, the same approach that I would somebody that I like being around? You know, if my and if my approach toward God um, and His relationship with me was based upon that kind of thinking, then God probably, you know, would be the person to go. I really love you, but you know, when you get to heaven, I got a place way out in another galaxy where I don't have to see you, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And yeah, and 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 that uh, I I I think God's love for us also involves He wants to hang out with us and He enjoys being with us. All right. So my love for another somehow has to represent that kind of thing. And if fellowship with God is um, an intimate and a close thing with dialogue, then my relationship with other people and trying to express God seems like it ought to have that same kind of thing. No matter how far away I may perceive them to be. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, it's my perception. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's the whole love thy neighbor thing and love your enemy. And if that doesn't somehow involve friendship, it, it again, it seems like a strange concept of of divine love to me. But yeah, right, I think you're on right. something there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, um, you know, so so I, I remember sitting in. Uh, there's no other way to describe it. It was an inquisition. <laughs> there, there were. 13 leaders of the denomination. Isn't that classic? There were 13 <laughs> in, in, in a circle and four of us from the gathering in Salem. And we were being questioned about our orthodoxy um, because of the way we had approached the pagan community. And somebody asked the question, how can you be friends with witches? There was a 45 minute discussion. <laughs> when the question was asked, you know, uh, we, we looked at each other like, <laughs> they're like our neighbors, duh. You know, it was, <laughs> how, do you, how do you handle a question like that? Because if it's to us, it was such a great absurdity. And after like 45 minutes of discussion, then one of the you know ladies pops up with the, the statement that, oh, you know, uh, I do have a friend at work who's, um, who's a witch, and she's really a lovely person, and we're friends. And, and I'm thinking, and <laughs> it, it, it takes 45 minutes for you to come up with an example of how this is a possibility. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, so so for us it was a way of life, but um, for them, it was because we intentionally did it. Right, it right. was perceived as somehow outside the scope of orthodox doctrine. Right. Yeah, and, which brings up, and I think you and I should should acknowledge for folks. You know, I understand uh, and appreciate the fear and the concern about this kind of approach Mm. in that people don't want to be spiritually compromised. Uh, They don't want to be contaminated. And the concern is if I, if I, it's one thing to defend the gospel, do apologetics or proclaim because that can just be, it's just a one way thing, but you guys are talking about friendships, uh, mutual conversation, humility, listening, as well as proclamation. And that is far more risky is there a risk of contamination? Yeah, there is. However, studies mm. indicate that in these interfaith or multi-faith kinds of conversations, more often than not, what happens is the faith of the uh, conversation partners ends up being strengthened by way of contrast through the right. conversation rather than one converting to the other. Does conversion right. sometimes happen? Yeah, it does. But, you know, Terry Muck uh is uh, one of my uh, heroes. He used to be, uh, years and years ago, he was editor of Christianity Today. He worked at Asbury uh, Seminary as a professor of mission. He's been involved in evangelical Buddhist dialogue for years. And in some of his writings, he draws upon the parable of the talents. 
uh, in that story, uh, one servant goes and uh, and hides the talent, you know, doesn't want to take any risks. And the other one goes and risks and invests it. And when the investor comes back, he rewards the one who took risk, not the one who played it safe. Mm. And he applies that to multi-faith conversations. Is it risky for what you and I do? Certainly it is. But I think it's worth the, the risks in terms of investing in other people and in terms of what we're trying to do in making this a better world to live in. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I have seen um, those risks. I've seen both sides of that. One of the, one of the places I've perhaps seen it strongest is in relationship to um, festival outreach, right? So taking teams of people to places like Burning Man, and and you having been there, written a paper about it, uh, you know, did master's, was a master's uh, right. thesis, right, yeah. Yeah. on Burning Man. Um, there's there's a lot of temptation at Burning Man, isn't there? I oh, mean, yeah. it's, it's a wild and a crazy place, and you can find anything you want. But that's the whole spectrum from, you know, deeply spiritual to intensely hedonistic. And, you know, so all of that is at the event. And so I've seen people who have fallen because of that. You know, that they've, people who were supposedly strong Christians and their investment into Burning Man becomes, an, you know, an eventual investment into uh, kind of hedonistic practices sure. and, you know, families being ruined and things like mm-hmm. that. I, I've seen that happen. Um, and, and, and that actually brings a strange phenomena into the picture because it seems that some of the people who were supposedly the most mature and strongest in the faith and actually had some real hardline views were more likely to fall than some people who (laughs) had They were just barely Christians, <laughs> you know. They, they, you know, they were like, "Oh, I like this Jesus guy," <laughs> you know. And, but somehow they fit into it, and they found a place of mission and a depth within their own spirituality by being involved with something like that, and didn't fall into the temptations. So there's, it, there's some strange thing going on that it wasn't some uh, our perception of maturity that determined whether a person was able to handle the dynamics of whether it's interfaith relationship. So, you know, I've certainly seen Christians who, you know, all of a sudden they, they want to get involved in, in tarot and astrology and things that, you know, typically everybody's going to be really scared about, or, you know, they, they start adopting the theology of the other and maybe eventually turn to that. I've seen that Mm -hmm. where conversion, you know, kind of occurs both ways. Yes. There's a danger, I suppose. But I, I tend to think that we take what is in us with us to that relationship. Um, there's, you know, so there's always that danger everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Uh, right. And, um, and I th- we're just acknowledging that concern. But what we're, I think what we're trying to say is let's not let that concern. And, and if you really search your heart and don't think that, this kind of thing can work for you for whatever reason. That's fine, but it's another thing not to do it. Another thing to disparage it. Um, right. So yeah. So, but but I think we would encourage folks. This is worth the risk. It, it's good for us, and it's good for the other, and it's good for our neighborhoods and the world we're living in. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, um, so Mike Steigel is on yes. right now. Um, hey, Mike. <laughs> and and he makes a statement that it causes you to reflect why you believe what you believe, which very often strengthens your beliefs because your analysis process provides you with uh, more robust foundations. Um, yeah, so he's he's in a sense echoing what you just said. Yeah, but these relationships where we disagree with the other, we actually strengthen our own position. Yeah, um, yeah, I. I've always had a problem with being part of an amen crowd. That was really boring. (laughs) (laughs) Right? I want, I I, I didn't want everybody to agree with me in the room. I, you know, I wanted something a little more exciting to be happening. (laughs) Yeah. 
in the, oh, in yeah. the processes I, of life. I mean, just in my own uh, conversations, I mean, yesterday I did a podcast that hasn't been published yet with uh, Lauren Wilkinson, who's retired from Regent. He's done a lot of work as a Christian in uh, earth stewardship and creation care. And uh, Bron Taylor, who was an advocate of dark green religion. It's kind of an eco spirituality. Right. And listening to Braun's story as a former evangelical about how he just couldn't, could no longer accept uh, the Christian message and how his love for the environment kind of came together to where mm. he is today, you know, makes me reflect on, uh, on, on my understanding of my religious tradition and its relationship to the environment. My conversations with Latter-day Saints, they believe in a, a God who's embodied, who's material, Right, uh, and that may, has made me go back and and research uh, and think about and reflect on the philosophy of how we understand the nature of God. So right. these kinds of conversations and ideas don't happen if we're just kind of nestled comfortably within our own religious tradition. So it gives us an opportunity to go deeper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so describe describe some of the relationships around you that. That you have and and you know you've described a couple points here of how some thoughts with individuals it's deepened your own you know thinking um and <laughs> not necessarily by fully changing it right 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 by deeping it so describe what those relationships look like what what do you what do you do with yeah, the other well, let me tell you about <laughs> one that kind of uh just fell into my lap out of curiosity most uh, recently. Um, I, I had been reading about uh, the Satanic Temple based in your former backyard in Salem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they capture a lot of headlines because they do some very provocative things to capture attention and to try. Oh, they're out on the streets with a, you know, talk to a Satanist they booth and, you know, uh, flyers every Halloween time. Yeah. Um, they're, they're fairly new to town. Um, uh, they came out of Cambridge and somebody bought a house in Salem and they set up there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and they, they've captured national attention in the headlines. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, create, put together a Baphomet, a huge, I think it's iron or bronze Baphomet statue and challenged in a couple of States, 10 commandments monuments on state property. And, uh, so they're very good at capturing attention and, and causing us to question mm. Christian privilege in the public square. And I was intrigued by it. And I just put out on Facebook, hey, I'm interested in talking to somebody who's a member of this group. And if anybody knows anybody, you know, if you could help make a connection. And uh, I got uh, a, a pagan friend of ours, David Dashvin Keys, who was said, yeah, I know somebody. Yeah. And I also know another uh, a scholar, uh, Joseph Laycock, who's written a book on it. And those okay. two guys kind of helped me connect with somebody, uh, Stephen Bradford Long. He's got a podcast called Sacred Tension, and uh, we exchanged some emails, and I came on his program. And the first program was largely me asking him questions on his show right. to help evangelical listeners who might dare to tune in to understand more about Satanism and his journey and the Satanic right. people and um, this kind of thing. And uh, it was interesting. During the course of the conversation, it was uh, – I don't know. There was, there was some kind of, not only because it's called sacred tension, but we didn't know each other and you could feel the tension. Right. But I think because of the way we were conversing um, towards the end of the conversation, he said, can I ask you some questions? I said, yeah, that'd be great. And so he asked me my thought on uh, how evangelicals should respond to, to former evangelicals, ex evangelicals. And he was one. And I said, okay. well, you know, there's there's a tendency to demonize those. You know, we blame them for not having enough faith and this kind of thing. I think mm. we need to listen critically to those journeys. What does it say back to the church about our failures yeah. in so many areas? And I think that was well received. And uh, eventually, he had me back on the right. podcast to talk about uh, the research you and I and our multi faith matters team had done into the psychology oh. of evangelicals and why we reject yeah. other religious traditions. And then most recently, he and I uh, co-authored an article for uh, Paul Lewis Metzger of Multnomah University, his Cultural Encounters Journal, Okay. Uh, where uh, basically I look at, at Jesus as an outsider figure that inspires me in multi-faith, and he looks mm. at Satan not as a literal, real spiritual being, but as a, a metaphor and literary figure of rebellion that inspires okay. him 
as a Satanist in multi-faith engagement. And so this, okay. this relationship came together just out of the blue and through conversations and, and empathy for one another, um, we've been able to do some work together. So oh, wow. and, and just as a PS uh, to that, uh, there was a Satanist. Oh, uh, uh, Stephen asked me to write a blog post for his blog also. And I wrote on evangelical fear of Halloween, which is right up your alley, Phil. <laughs> and uh, yeah, another right. Satanist saw that and read it. And then he did a blog post for Stephen saying, more hit is right. And rather than just demonizing evangelicals, we need to understand the fear and how we sometimes trigger that. And how can we have a more positive relationship? You don't get to that point of a positive interaction with Satanists who many times are right. having a reaction against Christianity unless you pursue this kind of friendship approach. Right, right, right. So so there was a, an example of your developing of a relationship, creating some of the Satanist community to rethink how they approach evangelicals. That, that's the end result. I didn't say, yeah. you know what? Yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah. to help these guys yeah, yeah. like us better. It was just me being willing to have a conversation with somebody and help evangelicals understand where they're coming from. And right. then through my responses to some of their inquiries and doing some writing and being, uh, I am, and I think you are too, we're very self-critical at times, not only of ourselves, but of yeah. our faith tradition. Absolutely. And we get heat for that sometimes. You know, you guys yeah. sound, uh, and, I, and I just try and, and remind our critics, you know, that seems pretty prophetic to me. The prophets <laughs> were always, you know, the right. prophets were always pointing finger at the nations. They were a lot of, most of the time, pointing right. at, at Israel and her right. feelings, <laughs> keeping the covenant with God. Yeah. And so there's something prophetic, and I don't think I'm a prophet, but there's something in the prophetic tradition to what we're doing. Right. And that isn't always well received, but sometimes the outsider can see that and find appreciation, particularly if they feel, if they've had negative experiences with the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that becomes, um, boy, that becomes one of the touch points from, from which we experience a lot of the kickback from our own tribe. Sometimes just the action of befriending the exiled other, you know, the, the post Christian who's now right. adopted another religion. Sometimes that in itself, um, becomes a critique on Christianity. You know, you you, right. you behave in that way. You don't have to say much to, <laughs> to have just said, um, look, we're doing it wrong. Here's how we ought to do it. You don't even have to say that. You just do things that way. And it's going to be automatically perceived as a critique before we say something. Then when we open our mouths, we're really in trouble. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of that is because um, I have found that I spend a lot of time um, agreeing with the critiques of Christianity by my friends who are outside of my faith. Oh, you, know, you you know Christians. I look at the history of the church and it's greedy and power hungry, and you know all these terrible things are going on. And I shake my head. <laughs> I say, "Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right." <laughs> yeah. And and I can typically say, "But I don't see Jesus doing it that way." And I'm just trying to do things His way, in in a simpler Christianity. And most people will agree with that as a valid observation, right? Um, uh, but then, you know, that obviously, uh, presents a problem to my own tribe because I've just said, yeah, we've gotten it wrong. And in fact, we've gotten it wrong for centuries. <laughs> so, um, how, how do we deal with that dynamic of having to, is that right for me to admit openly admit the faults of my own group in a sense, like, am I, are, are we putting out our dirty laundry uh, when we do that? I don't know that our dirty laundry is really hidden. I mean, uh, <laughs> right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's out there. I mean, maybe in the past you're able to do it, but especially with the internet now and social media and especially in a post Trump 
uh, kind of world. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's out there. And so I think the healthy way to address it is just to acknowledge that it's there. I think if you keep on denying it, trying to justify it, that just makes our, our present si uh, situation worse. I mean, I think evangelicalism right. now is suffering a serious credibility problem. And uh, you, you can come up with all the evangelistic pro uh, programs. You can come up with a great worship service and this kind of thing. But unless you address the the rot at the heart of evangelicalism, uh, we're not going to see any, any turnaround. So my right. hope is for nothing, no other reason than uh, you know rehabilitation of our our brand that evangelicals might be willing to be self critical. Mm, yeah. So uh, we just got a hey guys from uh, Jill Riley. Ah, hey Jill. She's, yeah, <laughs> that made me happy <laughs> to see her pop up here. <laughs> that there's somebody who knows how to do the stuff. That's that we're right. Talking about yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, hope you're doing well, Jill. Um, so where where do we? I suppose I want to ask this question: Where do we go from here? Um. I found, um, I'll put that question in perspective. So I found over the years that, um, you know, people would come to Salem during Halloween and work with us. At first, it would be a few people and there'd be a lot of skepticism and then they'd experience and they'd be like, wow, I got to come back. And, you know, oh, so over 20 something years, it went from a handful of us doing outreach on the streets and having a stage where there was live music and because it was a, a community stage that we sponsored, it wasn't like Christian concerts. It was just entertainment. And we had these encounter tents where people would enter them if they wanted to, you know, discuss things with us. And they were creative. We had dream interpreters, you know, who did it from like a Hebraic um, biblical perspective. And we had uh, people who were doing psalm readings instead of palm readings. And and people mm -hmm. loved it. And they were standing in line. We'd just have prayer for the sick or whatever. Um, so uh, it, over the years, I found that it slowly moved from a position of people who were fearful to a position where now I can make statements about how necessary it is for us to befriend witches and not treat them badly and a crowd of people I'm training will applaud mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean it, it's moved from uh, being very aggressively um, you know get that counter cult approach uh, and let's cast out demons and you know whatever else depending on somebody's religious you know whether they're Pentecostal or or a Baptist or, you know, whatever it was to, to now understanding that us being friends and loving people on the streets and, and trying to develop relationships with them is at the heart of the matter. Um, but it's still not, I wouldn't say it's still not the standard that we see across evangelicalism, even though it's accepted more. So, so where do we go from here? You mean in terms of trying to help, yeah, helping, a, trying to yeah. help the church see these necessity of behaving like this, especially well, I, in our growing multi-faith um, culture, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the numbers are dropping. If you look at the rise of the, the nuns, those who say they're right. they're not affiliated with any you know uh, institutional religion, that number is growing. Number of across the board for religion uh, Christian traditions, those numbers are going down. Yeah. Um, so that's the reality we face. And again, the, the backdrop of that is post-Trump, our credibility is in the tank. And I really think, you know, if you look at the history of the church, I think the church does best when she's on the margins, not when she's at the mm. center, right? And she's right. she's got power and this kind of a thing. Right. Um, I think there's, there's a hidden blessing in our present marginalization, but we've got to recognize the marginalization. That's the challenge. So I think if we can recognize that we are on the sidelines, our numbers may still be good in terms of the number of people who claim identification with Christianity in the general population, but the numbers are going down, our credibility is gone. And so maybe it's time to look in the mirror and say, man, what, what is going on? Yeah. And if we're willing to do that, hopefully with that can come, what is my stance towards the other? 
and is either ignoring them and just doing my own thing, you know, happy in the walls of the church and the Christian community, is that the best way forward? Or doing apologetics and refuting those that we disagree with, is that the best way forward? Or is it right. or is it asking that question that I asked myself years ago, how do I live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ in the midst of a, a rapidly changing world where a lot of people are going to choose to reject the spirituality that I hold dear? Am I defensive about it or can I befriend others? And through through our strongly held differences, can we still have relationship and friendship uh, for the common good uh, of the sure. society we live in? You know, sure. Yeah, we we just did a. There was just some statistics from uh, Gallup, I think it was this week, that the people going to church um, in any form, yeah, whatsoever, has dropped below fifty percent for the first time. Um, it's been a precipitous drop and uh, through the 20th century, but it just hit below the 50% mark. Um, I was surprised that it was even there. <laughs> yeah. Quite, frank, frank, quite yeah. frankly, if I look around me, right? Um, although it's an interesting thing, being back in Southern California has made me uh, see that a little bit different. So here in Long Beach, uh, you know, a couple places I might hang out. I hang out at a place called Fat Stogies, a cigar lounge, <laughs> in, you know, in Long Beach. And it's amazing how many people um, are Christian and have a church that they go to in that environment. In Salem, Massachusetts, <laughs> that <laughs> you were you were in a minority, maybe an extreme minority. <laughs> <laughs> It, it certainly felt like it, and it's, uh, yeah, and so it's not the case here. But um, yeah, our, our numbers are dropping, and um, and those numbers include those of us who have been um, disillusioned by our own Christian faith, and now have a hard time identifying with its uh, corporate expressions. You know that whether denomination or any kind of local church, right? Right. Um, and the and guns. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I I personally find that in in some of the things I'm doing in festivals, people who have kind of gotten done with they're tired and they're done with church, right, right. absolutely love joining us in in situations in festivals where we're doing an outreach, and they shine but they were misunderstood in the church, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling. I'm sure you do too. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got the certified letter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing I think is going to help us move forward. Um, I think that, you know, I've been asking myself for years, what is missing from evangelicalism? And um, Paul Metzger and I've had some conversations, our mutual friend at Multnomah, and we try to practice a cruciform spirituality and I found the I googled that term, and I found some works by Michael Gorman. He's got this uh, trilogy of books where he, you know, starts with Paul, and that's the essence of Paul's theology: cruciformity to be right, right, in right. Christ. And it, it doesn't mean um, whole, operating from a position of power, proclaiming to others without listening, uh, renouncing the other. It, it means humility. It means uh, you know taking on the mantle of Christ, just as he came right, in his right. ministry to give his life for others, to serve others. Um, that's what he's calling us to do. And, and I don't think that dominant form of relating to religious others in our culture is cruciform. I think this befriending uh, those who are, who evangelicals would consider outsiders, right, right, that's right. more cruciform. So I really think we have to dig deep in our own spiritual practice. What does that look like? in this new environment, do we need to pursue a different way? Yeah, that's a great Good Friday um, <laughs> <laughs> recognition there of, uh, you know, this this day represents how we ought to live, right? Yeah. Um, we, we live in a death to self. Um, and, and, and that has become, at least from my observation, it seems to become a thing that has been missing in much of, an evangelical tradition that's seeking political power. It's yes. seeking to maintain its position of dominance as the American religion and as a way of life and, you know, the culture uh, that we live in. 
and and trying to maintain that dominance seems to be the opposite of uh, living within a crucifixion model, right? I, right. I, I, and it, you know, and, and it makes me wonder: is is Jesus' silence at the trial um, before the Pharisees and the crowd, is to, and then before um, Herod, is his silence something of a model for me in the face of opposition? Mm. You know, both internally from those who attack me, as, you know, the Pharisees would have been an internal opposition um, from a religious and, and tribal perspective, but then externally from um, those outsiders, the pagan Romans. Um, is, is that um, silence of Jesus somehow give me a model for not having to defend myself um, at all? at all costs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. I mean, I think it, it can be certainly at certain times, uh, sometimes with uh, some of my attempted defenses with some of my counter cult folks, it does, doesn't seem to matter what I say, what I point to, what I do um, that can even register, let alone persuade. I mean, you had an idea when you and I were going back and forth about doing this podcast, you had the great yeah. suggestion. Why don't we invite <laughs> Some of the yeah, critics yeah. to come on and they can give their perception for a few minutes and we'll respond to it. And right, right. I reluctantly, you didn't know this, but I said, all right, Phil, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> a few folks. And I reached out to a couple of the counter cult folks yeah, yeah. That I interacted with in the past. Now keep in mind, I was in the counter cult about 20 years ago. Right. It's been a while. Yeah. And I reached yeah. out and said, Hey, we're doing this podcast and you know, here, here's the deal. Would you like to come on and be a part? And I got, I, I tore the scab off of their old wounds. And it was like we were back 20 years ago. Wow. Okay. And so they're, they're still angry with me over this kind of thing. And they said, yeah, you yeah. know, you still haven't described why what you're doing is different than what we're doing and all this kind of stuff. And my, I, I did respond and a right. few times and I gave links. I said, we did wrote a, a paper for the Lasan Committee for World Evangelization. We've got a book with case studies and theory I've done articles. Right. I don't know how to how to describe it anymore. And I drew upon that phrase. I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. And right. sometimes right, the, right. the question arises for me: Do sometimes do people not understand, or do they not want to understand? Hmm. Right. And I think we get to the point where maybe with some silence, just is the best way forward. You, you're doing, you're modeling it for people. And right. if they don't get it, then they're they're probably not going to get it. If I right. know what I say, yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. And I certainly think you know, of course, Jesus' situation is one where he's being attacked, right? Right. Um, he he's being accused, and so his silence becomes somewhat of a model. But then, in a sense, that's what I do when somebody comes to me. I don't know if you can hear the sirens in the background here. <laughs> No, we're good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I hear them. <laughs> um, so when somebody attacks my faith, telling me that, um, you know, all the problems that there is with it, and, and they're legitimate descriptors of things that have happened either in history or maybe even current events or Sometimes, you know, maybe something I did, uh, you know, it could be legitimate. Um, I, I have to shake my head and just agree. Rather than coming with a position of defending myself, uh, the humility is, yep, you're right. And too often, I think Christianity wants to defend itself. Um, but it defends itself at the expense of those it had previously betrayed. But, you know, so so if we defend ourselves against things uh, for things we've done wrong, I speak corporately there as well as personally, then we double down on the betrayal we've, you know, um, caused others. Right. So if somebody is hurt and I defend the action. I double hurt them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's what we've had a tendency to do within Christianity is to double down on the pain we've caused others. Um, so they, you know, the place of dying to 
that stuff is it's 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 a good time for it. It's a good good Friday to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and the challenge for you and I is I don't know about in your experience, but sometimes even when I, you know, when I came out of the counter cult, I just came to the mindset: you guys do your apologetic thing. I'm not going to try and persuade you anymore. Doesn't work for you. Didn't want to do it. That's fine. I'm going to do my missional dialogical thing over here. Right. And uh, that wasn't enough. I was pursued. And, uh, you okay. know, what, yeah. and, and I will admit early on, I, I was, I did have an angry response. These guys would mm. nip it at my heels. I would do, I would do posts. I was going through seminary at the time and I was reflecting yeah. on my studies and the new things I uh, was learning and what I was yeah. reflecting on. And they would pop in and do all these negative comments. And, uh, so it took me a while to, to work through that, mm. that response process. And for years I've, I've ignored them, um, and just kind of let them do their own thing. And right. uh, they can think what they want of me. It was only recently with the attempt at reaching out after 20 years. And we just, yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, I, I, I suppose I, uh, I was fortunate in the sense that when I moved to Salem, um, yes, there were critiques, but I had, in a sense, embedded myself into that community, right? So now I was surrounded more by the people who, you know, I, I said I was going to invest my life in. I was surrounded by neo-pagans and witches, and, and they were becoming my friends. And those who would critique me about it were not close. <laughs> they could, at best, just shout at a distance. And I was invested into that community, so uh, I, I, I suppose I, I, when I really got hit by it, <laughs> you know, when we got excommunicated, and you know, the whole Wall Street Journal story that came out back in two thousand six, um, that that hit me by surprise because I was so invested into that community spent so much time with that people i didn't see a growing opposition coming mm. at me right, right. right. <laughs> so it was kind of like slap <laughs> and and surprised me um and and i and i think to a certain degree um you know those of us who are investing ourselves in the lives of others that that some people in the church would want to keep as exiles right um we get surprised when somebody rises up and says, how can you be friends with, you know, gays, trans, you know, whatever it might be, Muslim, pagan. Um, how can you be friends with them? We, we're surprised because we're doing our best to invest ourselves in a manner we would expect Jesus would do it. Right. Um, and and yeah. it's just important that folks understand the loss uh, that you suffered, at least for a time, uh, by trying to pursue what you saw as the best way forward, the most Jesus-like way forward. Mine was not to your extent, but right. uh, we had moved from California to Utah, and uh, our largest supporter was our home church that we'd been a member of for years. I uh, had headed up their missions program. My wife was in the child care ministry. And we were out here and we started getting increase about, you know, they, they had some concerns and, and uh, I decided, all right, I'll fly out and address these concerns. And what right. happened was they had, they rotate uh, board members and they had a, a guy on who had, had uh, he was retired from Campus Crusade for Christ and he was raising concerns. And because my ministry wasn't about uh, providing body counts of conversions and I was taking uh, an incarnational approach, investing in people, relationships, this type of thing. What I was doing was seen as inappropriate and not real mission work. It was worthy of support. So they just dropped us like a hot potato. Wow. And that was our largest financial supporter. So there are, are real world consequences within evangelicalism for taking the kind of approach that you and I think is the appropriate right. biblical Jesus-like way forward. Right, right. Um to, to what degree do you think the tendency for um, observable, observable and numerical um, results, to what degree does that um, cause problems for this approach? 
You know, I, I guess I, you know, I, I'm going through right now the history of the altar call, how it right. developed, and the right. history of the sinner's prayer, and how that developed. And it, it's interesting how it tends to trend for the most part with the westward movement in America as it, you know, as as the nation grows and moves westward, and that that interesting. Uh, dynamic of a developing capitalism, right? Yes, yes. And now as there's larger gatherings, there's a need to somehow, okay, who's interested? We need to set you apart from others. And so you have this development of a, you know, a sinner's bench or an anxious bench. Um, and, and it develops into an altar call. And then you have to have a way of, you know, let's, it's almost like, let's close the deal. And we've probably both right. heard that term terminology yeah. about oh, yeah. coming to faith, right? As though it's some capitalistic interaction. Um, how, how does that become, do, do you see that as a problem in, in us moving now to this less of a monological but a, now a dialogical model uh, of uh, of ministry. Yeah, I think that that has been kind of the the approach, the template that's been followed. I mean, you mentioned capitalism. I would have I would have said uh, this is kind of a sales based kind of approach, where if you're yeah. not getting sales right, if you're not getting numbers, you're not doing it right. Right. And uh, so I think there's a difference between the concept of a numerical metric and other metrics of how we're impacting other people. Um, personally, uh, I don't consider myself uh, effective based upon numerics. It's faithfulness to an approach. If I am being Christ-like, if I'm pursuing this model, investing in people, then I, I'm successful. I'm not responsible for the numerics. And I, I, sometimes I think coming to grips with what the numerics are, that's, that's difficult. When do people come to faith? Right? Is it that? Is it the response to the sinner's prayer? Is it raising your hand? Is it a slow, gradual process where somebody can't even discern when the moment of transition was? Right. So I don't want to get wrapped up in the numerics. I just want to exercise faithfulness to a process and let let God worry about the results. Yeah, uh, that's his his area working in the hearts and minds. So yeah, yeah I do think that's yeah. going to be a problem for. A church that that has been so numbers based and it's very black and white. You're either in or out, right. and uh, we we need to to invest in that again that cruciform process of investing in people's lives, and that is far more gray and messy than I think we're comfortable with. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So so we're. I, I, I'm going to make a comment here, or I'm just going to read a comment. So Jill, Jill Riley. Um, says I, she was just going to say that um, incarnational ministry is so important. That's the Jesus way. It's our loss if we don't take the opportunity to build relationships with, quote, the other, unquote. We lose out, the kingdom loses out, and the other loses out on a chance to hear the gospel. So, Amen, Jill. <laughs> Preach it, sister. <laughs> Absolutely, that's good stuff. Um, so we're we're uh, we're coming to the top of the hour here. Um, so, <laughs> Jesus didn't say shy away from messy. That's a that's a comment from Mike Steigel. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so on this Good Friday, how would you encourage people to? Uh, pursue a multi-faith kind of approach to ministry. Yeah, I, I personally love this time of year. It's always interesting to me how so many American Christians seem to invest more in the Christmas holiday than they do in Easter. And yet Christmas really didn't take significance in the church until the Easter event. And then in retrospect, Christmas becomes important. I really think we ought to use this opportunity to reflect on the life of Christ, his sacrifice. And again, what does it mean for me to practice a form of Christian spirituality where I exercise humility and empathy for others, invest in their lives, and, and my witness comes through the kind of life that I live as well as the words that I speak as I invest in others and listen to others uh, as well in that process. So I, I think Easter is a perfect time to have this kind of conversation. What about you, Phil? Um, well, so before I, I say that, I want to yeah. get this in. 
how do people find you and how they how can they connect with you? Facebook, emails, websites, what? Yeah, the they stuff. can uh, find uh, find me at multifaithmatters.org. Um, they can look at that name and find, or they could find the links there. We've got a YouTube page where we have uh, the videos of our podcast. We've got a Podbean podcast page uh, where they can find us as well. And if they want to send me their nasty grams, they can do it at John W. Moorhead at MSN.com. All right. I hope you get some nasty. Crap. That's right. <laughs> so, so yes, there, um, for those of you watching this on Facebook right now, um, you can look for the multi-faith matters page. Um, that is it a group or a page? Uh, do you remember? Uh, anyway, on Facebook, it's a, it's a group. Okay. So multi-faith, uh, one word matters. And uh, that's something that John and I are both part of. Um, so you can connect with us there and hear more about this approach to doing things as well as going to the multi-faith matters website. And then you can see John's, uh, podcasting that, uh, he does. And, uh, so what, what I encourage, you know, I, I really think I would encourage boldness. And when I say that, um, what, what I mean is that. I think it takes a lot of courage to um, to not always defend yourself, but to listen to others and allow their lives to somehow become a part of your own. That you know, that's a courageous thing. Um, it's, it's kind of like the difference between staying home and traveling. Right. And, and I think that we should be, uh, missional Christians should be adventurous, intellectual travelers. You know, we should, and, and we'll find that we both learn as well as teach others. Um, so that would be my thing. Good words, my friend. <laughs> so this has been the Wild Theology Podcast. That is the awesome John W. Moorhead. Remember, you can connect with him at Multifaith Matters, and uh, you need to hear more from him because he's a smart guy. <laughs> okay. Always good times with you, my friend. <laughs> oh, good with you. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, it's been awesome, John. Thanks. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm.